Well, today the topic is words. Ever heard, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words? See, words are the game changers of the soul. Words change everything. Words have the, the power to fulfill us or to shut us down. Words of love and light and peace light up the frontal lobe of our brains and promote clearer thinking. Whereas words of strife and envy and bitterness wake up our primal lizard brain and slow down cognitive function. I watched a, a young mother the other day firmly telling her red face, fists clenched, vibrating with fr frustration child to use your words. And so she talked him down from physically acting out his anger. And she knew he had to learn to use his words before he took action. Now, people say actions speak louder than words. Uh, it's true, but also know that it was words that first motivated those actions. And words are by far the most powerful things on earth. Words open hearts. Words affect us deeply, emotionally, and spiritually. Words allow us to express ourselves. You know, words are a vehicle for change. Words allow anyone to free themselves of, of internal chains. Words, especially ones that are written down, separate humanity from all other creatures. Words unleash the power of the universe. Matthew 18, 19 from the message. Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are, are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. Now those are heap big powerful words. And uh, Hebrews 11.3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. See, it was words that, that spun up this entire universe in the first place. And it's words that still keep our personal universes spinning. So let's use our words wisely and change our own lives. A life without words. I've been thinking about the power of certain words, and as well as the limitations of life without well-chosen words, and how different would life be without those welcome, wonderful, and positive words. I re recently read a, um, an obituary from 1968 from the New York Times, and it was on Helen Keller. And she was born a normal seeing child and hearing child until she was about 18 months when a disease took them both from her. And without the ability to see and to hear or to speak words, you know, Helen was unable to develop and grow like a normal child. And the memorial went on to say, quote, after Helen's illness, her infancy and early childhood were a succession of days of frustration manifest by outbursts of anger and fractitious behavior, a wild, unruly child who kicked and scratched and screamed was, was how she afterward described, it, described herself. Now, speaking of words, Helen's parents were without hope until they came across a passage in a, a Charles Dickens article named American Notes. And the article described how Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe of the Perkins Institute in Boston was a pioneer teacher of the blind and the mute. The year was 1886. They went to Boston. And her family was, uh, her dad had served as a Confederate soldier in the Civil War. And now all her help she's going to get is from the North. And... Um, so, quote, shortly thereafter, the, the Kellers heard of a Baltimore eye physician um, who was interested in the blind, and they took their daughter to him. And he said that Helen could be educated and put her parents in touch with Alexander Graham Bell. 
He, he was the innovator of the, the inventor of the telephone and an authority on teaching speech to the deaf. And after examining the child, Bell advised the Kellers to ask his son-in-law, Michael Anagnus, uh, director of the Perkins Institution, about obtaining a teacher for Helen. And the teacher uh, this young man selected was a 20-year-old Ann Mansfield Sullivan, who was called Annie. She, she was partly blind, and Miss Sullivan had learned at Perkins how to communicate with the deaf and blind through a hand alphabet signaled by touch into the patient's palm. Quote, her brown hair tumbled, her pinafore so soiled, her black shoes tied with a white string, jerked Mrs. Sullivan's bag away from her, rummaged in it for candy and finding none, flew into a rage. Helen was six. And of her savage pupil, Miss Sullivan wrote, she had a fine head, and it is set on her shoulders just right. Her face is hard to describe. It is intelligent, but it lacks mobility or soul or something. It was days before Miss Sullivan, whom Miss Keller throughout her life called teacher, could calm the rages and fears of the child and began to spell words into her hand. The problem was associating words and objects or actions. What was a doll? What was water? Miss Sullivan's uh, solution was a stroke of genius. Recounting it, Miss Keller wrote, We walked down the path to, to the well house, attracted by the fragrance of the honeysuckle with which it was covered. Someone was drawing water, and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly I felt a misty consciousness, as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. There were barriers still, it is true, but barriers in that time, that in time, could be swept away. I love how she said that the first time she recognized a spelled out word, she said that she suddenly felt a misty consciousness as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. Do you remember the first time you heard a few well-placed and perfectly spoken words that change your life? Remember how those words fit perfectly within your soul? That's the same experience that she had. Proverbs 25.11 from the CEV says, The right word at the right time is like precious gold set in silver. The message says, The right word at the right time is like a custom-made piece of jewelry. It's designed just to fit you perfectly. That's how words can be. The right words. See, perfect words fit perfectly. And without the ability to understand words and the ability to communicate, Helen's actions had been primal. You know, she was in a constant state of survival mode. And most of the troubling and vicious people on earth today are people who have never heard or who have heard and rejected words laced with love and light and power. The words they've chosen to believe make, made them who they are, and they make them do what they do. Now, Helen graduated cum laude from Radcliffe in 1904, and with honors in German and English, and she had to take all the examinations like all the normal kids. And she gave her life and energy to helping the deaf and the blind. And in 1964, President Johnson awarded her, awarded her our nation's highest civilian recognition, 
the Presidential Medal of Freedom. See, Helen used her words for good. Here's one of her quotes. Your success and happiness lies in you. Resolve to keep happy, and your joy and you shall form an invincible host against difficulties. Pretty good. See, words helped Helen transform from a wild child to the amazing person she molded herself into. Romans 12, 2 from the EXB. Do not be shaped by, conformed to, pressed into a mold by this world, age. Instead, be changed within, transformed by a new way of thinking or changing the way you think, the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to decide, discern, test, and approve what God wants for you is God's will. You will know what is good and pleasing to Him and what is perfect. Do you want to have a great day? A great year? A great life? Then give yourself the gift of words. Give yourself the gift of language, the language of love, the language of light, the words of truth. These are the things that change a person's soul, that turn us from, from somebody that, that relies solely on, on primal instinct to somebody who can function at a, at a super elevated level. You know, the right words at the right time will turn on the lights of our hearts so that we too can transform into the person we were designed to be. Everybody thinks they're here on earth for a reason, but very few know what that reason is. The right words will unlock it for you. You've got to find the right words. The positive to negative ratio. And I've seen countless studies on the, on the amount of positives it takes to overpower a negative. Some say that it takes three positives to op- overpower just one negative, while others say it takes five positives to overpower one negative. Helen Keller said, keep your face to the sunshine and you cannot see a shadow. Helen Keller. See, one research team went as far as setting the positive to negative ratio at exactly 2.9013 to 1. (laughs) A PhD named Barbara Fredrickson wrote, quote, just as zero degrees Celsius is a special number in thermodynamics, the three to one positivity ratio may well be a magic number in human psychology. And you'll find that these numbers, they're not random. It takes a lot more positives to overpower one negative. And every human's gonna be a little bit different. I'm not sure what the ratio would be for each of us, but I do know that it takes more positives to overpower one single negative than it does the other way around. And you and I will need to work out our own perfect ratio. And that being said, it's proven that it takes at least three positives to counter one negative word or action. Some of us, it might take eight. I don't know. You know yourself. Your number, will be, your number will be at least three positives to counteract one negative. Now, this is important. And if we apply what I'm talking about here, this is not new science. It just is, it gets, it's easily forgotten. See, 2 Timothy 1.7 gives us an example of a three-to-one positive ratio. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or cowardice, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. One, two, three. Power, love, sound mind. You see, I know what you're thinking. If negatives are harder to counter than positives, then why does such a little bit of light so easily dispel a whole lot of darkness? Well, that's a whole lot of talk. You see, darkness is nothing more than the lack of light. That's all darkness is. It's a life without light. A heart without light. And darkness is the primal void that can only be corrected with words 
that enlighten. Just like it turned on a switch in your, in your heart and life, um, it, it, it can do it for, for other people. See, um, here's another quote from Helen Keller. The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. You know when those words fit perfectly. Professor Clifford Nass of the Stanford University um, obviated that negative emotions typically, typically require more thinking and that negative information is processed more thoroughly in our minds than positive information. And that's why people tend to ruminate over unpleasant events far more than they ruminate over positive times. Negatives have far more <clears throat> deep effect on us than positives do. If you um, won $500, that's great. But if you lost it, you'll remember that for a, a lot longer. <laughs> or somebody steals it from you. You see, it's because how, how humans are wired. God designed us so that we would survive on this earth. We'd be aware of the negatives. We would react to them. But that's primal. We've got to learn to think a step higher. We've got to put higher thoughts into our minds and hearts and, and, and vocabulary. You know, words are, are our Words are our game changers. They're our ratio equalizers. Words give wings to abilities that negatives once locked down. Words give us the courage to live above our previous limitations. You ever read a book and you go, gosh, I never thought about that. You know, or, or, that, or how somebody thinks, you know, they, all these wonderful words have been written down. We, we read something in the Bible. Gosh, if they can do it, I should be able to do it. But if we never read those words, we would never know. I mean, I talked to a guy who is, uh, is a self-proclaimed Christian. I was talking to him about Jesus Christ and, and how to get born again. And I said, he died, you know, for our sins and, and was raised. He said, yeah, it was horrible how they stoned him to death. And I thought, <laughs> I decided not to try to correct him or anything. He's a, he, he just, he isn't a church-going Christian, you see? I mean, so he didn't even know how he, was, how he, how he died. And, uh, you know, but words, imagine if we can really understand the tr truth and light and love for what it really is and not for what somebody told us it is. I mean, our life will be different. You know, and, uh, you know, so I was thinking how words, uh, you know, it's the right combination of words that set us free. Like John 8, 32, very common verse. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Truth is just words. It was communicated to you in words. You know, whether it's braille, whether it's verbal, whether it's written, where, you know, somehow you saw it on a movie, you know, children's Bible, you know, somehow words, you know, touched us. No animals have that. They don't have words. They communicate, but they don't have words. They can't think thoughts beyond what they, what they see and know and feel. You know, people think their dogs are telepathic. <laughs> They're just good at reading you. <laughs> see, see, truth comes to us in the form of words, written, spoken, lived. And, uh, and we, we need to... We need to make it easy for ourselves to, to be able to pull truth out of, out, of this, out of darkness, so to speak. Helen Keller said, life is, neither a great, life is either a great adventure or nothing. And, and it's, it's truth, it's words that unlock that adventure. Somebody said, 
You know, boy, you got to see the Redwoods. You got to see Moab. You got to see the Grand Canyon. Or you got to go to Europe. You got to go to Italy. You got to go to Ireland. Those are words. And then you you think, then you look at some travel guide and you read words and you said, man, I got to go. Or you think, I've been, I've been feeling bad about myself for years and years. And then you read, somebody said, you don't have to feel bad about yourself. You can change your life. You can change yourself. And you go, man, I want to change myself. Words. It's all words, folks. You know, regarding the power and impact of words, Psalm 138, 2 says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Another virgin says, you have made your word even greater than the whole of your reputation. The CJB. See, if God places his word, his words above his amazing reputation, what should we do? We should place his words above any other thought process. When you feel like acting out like that little child, you see, you don't. You control yourself with words. You talk yourself down. You see movies where the, the, some mediator comes and talks somebody off a ledge back into the building. We have to talk ourselves off the ledge at times. But it takes multi, you know, you might have that thought, I don't want to live anymore. You might keep repeating that, but then how many positives is it going to take to where you love yourself again? It's a lot more, but it's sure worth doing because you sure are worth knowing. You know, we have to choose our words wisely if we're to counter the negative words of darkness. You know, 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 says, And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. See, just because it's, it's popular or politically correct to say a thing a certain way doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it right. Armies have been mobilized and the world has been thrust into hellish wars because of words manipulated and minds manipulated, you know, by words. How does a whole country go along with certain things? It's just words and words. The, 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 uh, the negatives have overpowered the positives. You know, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In whom the God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. What do they believe? Words. Or what do they not believe? Words. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. I mean, the whole point of the great enemy is to stop us from seeing the potential that's out there. It's this word, it's, this, it's a word manipulation. That's all it is. And we've got to get our words back. Get back the words that, that, that made you, that gave you, put light in your eyes when you were a child. What was it? Professor Roy Baumeister of Florida State University co-authored a, a book titled, Bad is Stronger Than Good. And he says it's just human nature to allow negatives to overpower positives. Quote, bad emotions, bad parents, and bad feedback have more impact than good ones. Bad impressions and bad stereotypes are quicker to form and more resistant to disconfirmation than good ones. End of quote. He also pointed out that many good events can, can overcome the psychological events of a bad one. He believes in a ratio of five goods for every one bad. Everybody's got their number, but it's, they're always three or five, you see. So get five. You know, <laughs> you know, maybe you're strong enough and you only need three, but I might need five. I need five positives to counteract the negative. And the better and the faster we get at doing that, 
when the pressure's on, the faster we'll see success. See, aren't the greatest athletes the one who've developed a way to shift effortless, effortlessly from defeat to victory? They get knocked down, they get up, and they keep going. They strike, strike, strike. They strike out three times, four times in a game, and then they're, they're up. It's the last inning. You know, there's, the bases are loaded. They got three balls, two strikes, and then how do they control their mind like that? You see, they've just trained themselves. To think, they, they just naturally just think, I'm going to do it. I can, you know, I'm a winner. I, you know, I'm going to hit, you know, they don't think, I hope I, I hope I can. Or I wonder, I hope I don't strike out. I'll sure look foolish, like most people would think. Everybody's staring at me. <laughs> Whereas all that guy can see is the ball. And he tries to watch the thread spin so he can see what kind of ball it's going to be. Is it a curve? Is it a slider? What is it? fastball sort of time slows down for you when you put on the positives about yourself you want to be able to excel in life you got to get it to slow down got to get it to slow down and we do that by just training ourselves to quickly fast fast forward fast motion put the positives into our mind I remember uh, my my daughter um, when she was a little girl, liked to ride the riding lawnmower around our, our yard. And it had an acre, full acre, about the size of a football field. And so she'd do this, and we'd, I, I would disconnect the blade. <laughs> and she'd drive that thing around and had the greatest of times. And the neighbor kids would come and, and ride a lawnmower, you know. <laughs> and uh, I probably would have wanted to when I was that age, too. And... Uh, and then one time it ran out of gas. And so the kid went and grabbed this blue gas can next to my house and he filled it up. And, and all, I was in the office today and I heard this poof. Yeah, and he had put, instead of gasoline in there, put kerosene in there. And all this, it, it made one cra crank and it went poof. And then the whole thing just went up in smoke. It didn't blow it up. So I had to drain that fuel out and put gas in and get it to work. Of course, I was a little little bit angry and I don't think those kids ever came around again <laughs> but the but the the point was it was the wrong fuel and we live this life with the wrong fuel there's so many wrong words that's why this world is like it is that's why people are are, are doing such crazy terrorist acts because they don't have the right fuel in their head and they're and they're relying on this primal instinct and they just go for the anger they just go for, you know, whatever. They have these malleable minds. And then somebody has just manipulated them. They're not living their dream anymore. They're living someone else's dream. Live your own dream, folks. Where, where our thoughts and, and behavior ca contradicts the Word of God, it means it's the world is in that part of our life. It means that the angel of darkness, so to speak, has, has manipulated us to, to act a certain way. We can change that with more light, more good. What's your plan? You know, how do you counteract the negatives? Now, some people I read about, they actually on the computer make a file, like a positive file. One guy called it his kudos file. And then every time he got a positive note, somebody sent him a, a, a note of love or, or some, some positive thing, he puts that in that file. And so when he gets really hammered, you know, by a negative, somebody hates his, his writer and hates his blogs or whatever he's doing online, he just goes to that positive file and reads five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these things. And then he gets his head back. Not everybody's going to love you, folks. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and so when, when times get bad, what do you go to? In times of pressure, what do you go to? If we don't have a go-to, then we're just going along with the course of the world. You know, others have a lengthy go-to verse list or a lengthy ver set, set of quotes that bless them. And they have certain ones that help them in certain times. You gotta have something, you gotta have something to go to. 
Didn't Jesus Christ go to the word? It is written. It is written. It is written. He had a go-to list of what he went to when he got hammered. He couldn't, no one could have gotten hammered more than he did when he was tempted of the devil and tempted those 40 days. You know, that's what got him through his tough times. And so it's positive words that get you through your tough times. Sometimes you might just pick up the phone and, and call that friend or call that family member who has that awesome ability to build you up. That's okay, too. It's words, folks. It's always words. Always has been. Always will be. But without those right words, we just live in this little, this, this small little primal spot. And we just react to whatever whim you know, that our enemy uh, pushes us to. We've got to have quick access to these things. What do you do? What's your system for success? The quicker you can access the, those, the positive, your positive to negative ratio, the quicker you can get on with your amazing life. You ever had somebody say something to you and it just stopped you? It just ruined your day. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to even think it works. I mean, I've had it happen where I'm almost just frozen. Sometimes when that happens, I go for a run because it just takes my mind off of that stuff. And then by the time I'm done exercising, I don't, I'm not thinking about it anymore. Everybody has their own routine, but you got to have a routine. And in the middle of a business meeting, you can't go for a run. <laughs> or maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> you know? So we got to go for a run in our mind. Get that dopamine going. Do something to build yourself up while, while all hell's breaking loose around you. Slow it down as we speed up the word, the right words. The noted psychologist John Gottman explored the positive to negative ratio in marriage. This is interesting. And he came up with a uh, this was a 10-year research he did. And he came with, with, the, with again, the 5 to 1 ratio to maintain a healthy marriage. And he and his team were able to predict with amazing accuracy if a newlywed couple would get divorced or stay married. And they observed a 15-minute conversation behind this, this newly married husband and wife and cataloged their positive to negative exchanges. And 10 years later, they followed up with the 700 couples that they had, they had interviewed and talked to and realized they had correctly predicted who would stay married and who would get divorced with 94% accuracy. If a scientist can predict with a 94% accuracy the fate of a marriage, just think of the success we can forecast for ourselves if we overpower one negative with five positives. Words helped Helen Keller transform herself from an uncontrollable wild child to the amazing person that she molded herself into. Words are always the game changers of our soul. Words of love and light and peace light up the frontal lobe of our brains and promote clear thinking. Words of strife and envy and bitterness and hatred wake up our primal lizard brain and slow down the cognitive function of that frontal lobe. It's our choice which we allow. One drives us to darkness and the other drives us to great light and victory and success. So let's train ourselves to replace each and every negative with three, four, or even five positives, and our lives will become an amazing, positive, self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the power of words. God bless.